We must be honest about the foundations of the political and economic systems we call America. I love America because of her potential, but I know that America will never even get close to being a more perfect nation until we are honest about the politics of rejection. I want to tell you about some of the leaders who are building the Poor People's Campaign. Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama, who had to bury her daughter, Venus, because she didn't have health care. I'm here today to share my daughter's Venus's story. Venus discovered a small lump in her breast and she wasn't insured. Venus had to be approved for every prescription and every piece of medical equipment that she needed. I'm standing here today in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign because no one should have to bury their child in America because they don't have health care insurance. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. I'm a second generation fast food worker and I've experienced the cycle of poverty firsthand. Growing up, I watched my mother endure long hours of back-breaking labor, doing everything she could to feed me and my sisters. My employer barely pays me enough to pay rent and utilities, let alone with the medical expenses with my mother. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung. And it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My only chance of going to college was joining the Army. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. Hi, my name is Pamela Roche. I'm from Downs County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. And I got raw sewage. I don't have no, no money. I'm poor. And I had to travel back and forth to Birmingham to f take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have a car and don't have no way to, to take her. This is the largest encampment in Aberdeen. There's about a thousand people in a town of 16,000 who are homeless. In my community, we were all shut off for the day because none of us could afford our water bills. In the past, my family wasn't able to afford electricity in the winter. It was very hard on all of us. This wall. This is sin of the highest order. When there are 38 million poor children, when 60% of African Americans are poor, when 65% of Latinx are poor, when 40% of Asians are poor, when there are 67 million poor white people, we must say, this is not right. immigrant and single mother. I grew up in southern Africa where my family was involved in the anti-apartheid struggle and we were deported when I was young. When I came to the US I found there is no safety net for immigrants. You can't get help of any kind as you struggle to survive. You can't even open a bank account for months. How are we supposed to feed our kids? And now they're tearing our children away from us. Many of us do domestic work, cleaning, yes, some do sex work. As poverty increases, so does prostitution. 5.1 million families in the U.S. can't afford the basics like rent and food. Sex work is a way that women, particularly single mothers, 
have found to feed, clothe, and put a roof over our children's heads. We are not ashamed of what we have had to do so to survive. I think it is a brave act. I think it is a brave act for a woman to refuse the desti destitution and poverty they plan for us and to take this step and face arrest and prison because prostitution is heavily criminalized in this country and like the war on drugs, racist enforcement of the prostitution laws target black and other women of color who are most arrested and most imprisoned. Street-based workers and trans women face particular stigma, discrimination, and brutal violence, including from the police. The criminalization of sex work increases vulnerability to violence. Serial murderers operate, and little is done, such as in Los Angeles, where shockingly, over 200 black women, many of them sex workers, have been murdered or disappeared since 1986. We support the work of the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders, which has for decades organized to get the police to investigate. The murders were dismissed by the police as NHI, no human involved. Yep. That's what they called them, no human involved, and did nothing about it. We demand the decriminalization of sex work so that sex workers are entitled to the same occupational health and safety rights as other workers. We demand resources such as welfare, housing, and income so that those that want to leave prostitution can do so. We want our struggle for justice to be counted as part of the movement against injustice. That's why we're joining with the Poor People's Campaign. <laughs> to fight against poverty and racism, the war economy which devastates us all, and for a society that values all of us. Thank you. About faith. My name is Brittany Ramos de Barros. I'm a woman, I'm white, I'm Latina, I'm black, I'm queer, and I'm a combat veteran. As a person existing at the intersections of these identities, I carry a grave conviction in my core that there can be no true economic, racial, gender liberation without addressing the militarism that is strangling the morality and empathy out of our society. For decades, we have been lulled into complacency and inattention as our drones have obliterated weddings, funerals, religious ceremonies, ordinary homes, and ordinary people. It is no mistake that we are waging war in at least seven countries, and all of them are mostly impoverished, black, brown, and Muslim countries. The same systems that shame and dehumanize us based on our skin color and our documentation status or bank account here want us to believe that those injustices have nothing to do with us. They want us to believe the lie that, that the precious lives of our soldiers are being spent for the protection of our freedoms. But I spent a year witnessing the bravery and beauty of the Afghan people. Men and women, fathers and mothers, risking their lives and their families to overcome oppressive organizations that we funded and enabled. I cannot forget their faces. This is a racial justice issue. This is a gender justice issue. This is an economic justice issue. We begrudge the poor for the pennies we give them to eat and survive, but chair for the nearly 600 billion annually we spend on defense. The 
military industrial complex is literally corporate greed weaponized. The United States government is the largest weapons dealer in the world and the largest user of those weapons. From the militarized equipment in which our police forces and federal agencies are clad to the large percent of current and former soldiers conditioned for war and then hired to occupy our streets to keep peace, is it any wonder that our neighborhoods are treated like combat zones and our neighbors treated like combatants? From the toxic masculinity that objectifies our bodies as nothing more than weapons or toys to the nationalism that tears us away from the true patriotism that is demanding that America live up to the dream that it has always been. These wars are immoral. Profiting off of killing is immoral. It is time to stand up and we won't be silent anymore. Dr. King was with the poor. The Reverend Dr. William J. Barber and the Reverend Liz Theo Harris are with the poor. Let's hear now from the architects, the servant leaders. They're not just leaders. They're servant leaders resurrecting the spirit of Dr. King. Please welcome the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris and the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber. Good morning, Washington, D.C. Good morning, these United States of America. Good morning, First Nations. And good morning, world. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are a powerful group of poor people and moral leaders and activists and organizers and freedom fighters. And 40 days ago, on Mother's Day, we launched this campaign. Today, we converge on the National Mall, right in front of the U.S. Capitol. We converge from every country, every corner of this country for a call to action to announce our work has only just begun. Because over the past 40 days, people of all races, colors, and creeds have joined together to engage in nonviolent, moral, fusion, direct action to demand that we lift all families up. We lift all people up. We don't break them apart. It is unjust immoral and unnecessary to have millions of poor people in this land. It is unjust, immoral, and unnecessary that we have children warehoused across this country because of their immigration status, because of their homelessness, because their families have no access to water. We need a poor people's campaign. So we are building one. And over the past 40 days, we, the people, have taken over streets and Capitol buildings and human service departments and housing offices and departments of environmental quality, and governor's mansions, and Senate and House office buildings, and the Supreme Court, and the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. 
making it clear that our politicians and to the people that we are here. We are poor. We are disenfranchised. We are immigrants. We are low-wage workers. We are veterans. We are sick. We are poisoned. We are homeless. We are separated from our families. And we are going to keep coming back until everyone has housing rights, everyone has voting rights, everyone has health care and living wages and quality, equitable education and clean water and peace and peace and peace and justice that we all need. We have seen the creative actions of poor people and moral leaders and activists in nearly 40 states across the nation over the past 40 days. Over 3,000 people have presented ourselves for nonviolent civil disobedience. We have reached tens of millions on Facebook and Twitter, historians, are describing the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, as the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in state capitals in the 21st century. The most expansive, the largest wave of nonviolent civil disobedience. And today, on June 23rd, countries all over the world are holding solidary actions with the Poor People's Campaign here. We reject the lie that there is scarcity when we live in abundance, that there should be anyone homeless when there are abandoned luxury houses, that there should be anyone he without health care when we have hospitals and the latest equipment and the best doctors. That there should be anyone hungry when we throw away enough food to feed every person, not just in this country, but across the world. We reject that we have to choose between advocating for voting rights and housing rights and living wages and an end to war. We know we need a movement to unite us all together. We reject heretical assertions that our sacred texts, that our constitution justify taking away children, building up walls, cutting social programs, and oppressing the poor. Because the Bible I read, the prophet Isaiah proclaims, woe to you who pass unjust laws to deprive the poor of their rights, making mothers their prey, taking advantage of homeless children. And we reject the narrative that poor white people and poor black people and poor Latino people and poor indigenous people and poor Christians and poor Jews and poor Muslims and voting rights activists and homeless activists and those fighting extreme extraction and equitable education advocates and low wage workers and queer and trans youth and veterans and millennials and our elders can't come together because my God, we have over the past 40 days, over the past few months, we have come together. There are state coordinating committees in 40 states across this country building the Poor People's Campaign. There are teams of lawyers and doctors and media makers and cultural artists and theomusicologists who 
have stepped forward to build a movement. There are signs and chants and t-shirts and songs that unite us in this campaign. And there are thousands of leaders across this country who have stepped forward to say, we're in this for the long haul. We're going to finish this race. Four together. Four together. We proclaim somebody is hurting our people. And it has gone on for far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. We cry out. We are a new and unsettling force. And we are powerful. We are a new and unsettling force. And we're here. We sing out. We went down to the Capitol and we took back what they stole from me. We took back our dignity. We took back our humanity. And we will keep letting people know that everybody has a right to live. That everybody has a right to live. And that before this campaign fails, we'll all go down to jail because everybody has a right to live. Today, we honor Dr. King, leaders, like Reverend Annie Chambers of the National Welfare Rights Organization, the Jewish Federation, the Appalachian Volunteer Corps, the United Farm Workers, and so many others who launched the Poor People's Campaign 50 years ago. And today, on the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign, we remember the words of Reverend Dr. King just two weeks before he was assassinated. Power for poor people will really mean having the ability, the togetherness, the assertiveness, and the aggressiveness to make the power structure of this nation say yes when they may be desirous to say no. That's what we're doing. We're building the power of poor people. We're building fusion coalitions in 40 states to take action together. We're building a set of demands that will lift up the poor, protect voting rights, protect the earth, and shift our war economy into a peace economy. And so I question all of you gathered here, all of you who are part of this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. If you believe we have it, repeat after me. Ability. Ability. Togetherness. Togetherness. Assertiveness. Assertiveness. Aggressiveness. Ability, Ability. Togetherness. togetherness, assertiveness, assertiveness. Aggressiveness. aggressiveness, ability, Ability. Togetherness. togetherness, assertiveness, assertiveness. aggressiveness, because I believe we do. And now, I have the great honor of introducing you to the heroes and heroines of this nation. Those people who come out of homeless encampments and from states that have not expanded Medicaid, that live in communities with poisoned water and in trailers with raw sewage in their yards, 
Those people who have been locked out of their state capitals, locked to their governor's mansions, those who have been hauled off to jail for standing for justice, and those who have prayed on the streets at the Supreme Court in the halls of power across this country, prayers of justice and mercy and peace. Today, at this call to action, we recognize all of you who have engaged in organizing, educating, singing, marching, voter registering over the past 40 days and months before. So please lift up those leaders with your voices and your applause. Today at this call to action, we honor those who have engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience. If you got arrested or tried to get arrested over the past 40 days, please raise your hands tall. Make your hands wave. And everybody, lift these leaders up. Raise your voices and appreciate these heroes and heroines. And we recognize the states and the First Nations that have been involved in organizing, organizing, organizing. So please welcome some of the leaders of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. It's time for the revolution. My brothers and sisters, let me take about seven minutes and then we're going to begin to hear from the people. Today, you are the founding members of the 21st Century Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We gather today for a call to action. We gather here declaring it's time for a moral uprising all across America. This is not a commencement, this is a commencing. This is not the commemoration of what happened 50 years ago. This is the reenactment and the reinauguration. Because you do not commemorate prophets and prophetic movements. You go where the blood, where they fell, and reach down in the blood and pick up the baton and carry it the next mile of the way. For three years, we've been laying a foundation from the bottom up, not the top down, because helicopter leadership will not save us. Today, from this stage, no person will speak at the podium by themselves. Today, because of the continuing reality of two Americas, one land, the land of the very few with extreme lots, and the other land of the many with the very little who suffer dots, daily ongoing st stress syndrome of their lives and the attention violence by the political culture toward the poor. We are here. People are watching by live stream around the country and the world. We are here to call the nation to action, to get our marching orders. We are here to put a face on the facts of poverty. Uh, we are here of every race, every color, every creed, every income, every faith tradition, especially the poor, coming together, declaring that we must have a poor people, not march, a poor people, not rally, but a poor people's campaign to save to say not the Republican Party, to say not the Democratic Party, but to say the very heart and the soul of this nation. Don't get it twisted. We are not the left. We are not the right. We are not the conservative. We are not the liberal because those phrases are too puny and too weak and too limited. No. This campaign is standing in the deep moral tradition, in the deep religious, 
and moral traditions that have always been necessary throughout history in order to lift those at the bottom and save countries from destroying their own potential. We are in the same moral tradition of the prophets of Israel who challenged kings and rulers to stop legislating evil. We are in the same moral tradition of Jesus whose evangelical work was not being against gay people but being against poverty. We are in the same moral tradition of the Apache and other indigenous spiritual people who taught us to care and not, and not destroy and poison the air, water, and the land. We are in the same moral tradition of the abolitionists who knew if slavery was legal, it was still immoral and it had to be challenged. We are in the same moral tradition of the reconstructionists who after the Civil War fought for equal protection under the law. We are in the same moral tradition as the social gospel movement who looked at poverty and corporate greed and asked, what would Jesus do? We are in the same moral tradition of those who fought for labor unions and decent wages and eight-hour workdays even when they were killed and hung in places like Chicago. We are in the same moral tradition as Cesar Chavez and MLK and Rabbi Heschel and Fannie Lou Hamer and Swana Cheney and Goodman and Rosa Parks and Unitarian and Muslims like Malcolm and gay people and social justice activists like Bayard Rushton. We stand in the same moral tradition that have always fought to help this nation be a little more a little more grounded in love, truth, and peace, and to come a little closer to being a more perfect union. This is who we are. Make no mistake, America, you've got to get a new lexicon for this. You won't be able to report this like you've normally reported it. We are black. We are white, we are brown, we are red, we are yellow, we are gay, we are straight, we are old, we are urban, we are rural, we are Jewish, we are Christian, we are Hindus, we are Muslim, we are people of faith, we are people not of faith, from Alaska to Alabama to the deep south in Mississippi to northern Maine, from California to the Carolinas, from the Midwest, from the Rush Belt to the Wheat Belt, we are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival and we won't be silent anymore. And since folk want to quote scripture, in Ezekiel 22, the Bible says, your politicians are like wolves, prowling and killing and taking whatever they want. But something is worse, your preachers cover up for the politician by pretending to have vision and special vision and say God said it and God ain't said nothing. And because of this, extortion is rife, robbery is epidemic, the poor and the needy are abused, outsiders are kicked around, immigrants are mistreated with no access for justice. So God says, I'm looking for somebody to stand in the gap. Who will stand in the gap was the question 2,600 years ago, and it's the question right now. When there are 140 million poor people in this country and over 200,000 die every year from poverty while 400 families make an average of $197,000 an hour, the gaps are real. When we see homelessness on the street, especially among our children and LGBT communities, the gaps are real. When voter suppression is targeted at black, brown, and poor people in ways like we haven't seen since the days of Jim Crow. And when, the, when voter suppression and gerrymandering and the refusal to fix the Voting Rights Act is happening right here in the Congress and in state capitals. And it hurts poor people and sick people. And when the people who use racist voter suppression, once they get power, use that power to hurt white people and black people and brown people, the gaps are real. When poor folk live in communities where by the millions they can buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. When America is the richest nation in the world, 
poor and working people, and, and, but we don't have health care for everybody. When Puerto Rico is left and thousands die, when in Alaska they drill in the native lands and when in the, in, the, in the Apache lands they poison the water and when we don't have the health care we ought to have, the gaps are real. When a politician gets free health care just because they got elected but then they don't want the people that elected them to have the same thing they have. And when far too many preachers are engaging in theological malpractice and they will pray P-R-A-Y for politicians and president but not say a word when those politicians and the president pray P-R-A-E-Y on the least of these, the needed and the children, the gaps. When they claim that they have Jesus agenda, but they don't do or say what Jesus said. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was a stranger, did you take me in? When we live in a country where some will justify caging, not just children, but brown children, like animals, and they will separate and snatch them from their parents, and separate and snatch children from health care, and separate and snatch children from food stamps. The gaps between justice and injustice are real. And so it is our calling, as long as we've got breath in our body, right now and right here, to stand in the gap. Is there anybody ready to stand? Until the cries of the poor are heard and things change, stand. Until the cries of the sick get everybody health care, stand. So we can save this nation from a spiritual, economic, and political death, stand. We must stand in the gap and speak truth. Stand in the gap and non-violently go to jail if necessary. Stand in the gap and mobilize voters. Stand in the gap and build power among the poor. We must stand with love. We must stand with truth. We must stand with grace. We must stand until we restore or, or build the heart of this nation. And we must stand. This is no time to retreat. This is no time to cry. This is no time to be silent. This is no time to run away. We must stand and declare that we were born for such a time as this. Is there anybody willing to stand until every gap is closed? Stand until America lives up to her promises. Stand until we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there anybody willing to stand? Stand. Stand. Stand, 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 and when you've done all, stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now is the time for us to hear from the witnesses, testifiers, who put a face on the facts and to set up the first section, systemic racism. You can't address poverty without addressing systemic racism. Our brothers and sisters are sleeping on the streets. For a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and it's wrong. Our backs are against the wall and we got no choice but to push. <laughs> Follow that breaking news in Albany where a large group of protesters have moved into the street. Washington Avenue between City Hall and Lark Street closed down. Protesters with the Poor People's Campaign of Indiana. Two o'clock on the east coast, two o'clock in the middle, two o'clock on the west coast. A wave and the historians tell us it's never happened before. Our communities, Muslim communities, who have joined the Poor People's Campaign, you can count on us. Our democracy is in trouble. Our democracy is in trouble. And we come to demand. And we come to demand. Second warning. 
because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. No one is listening. We write letters, we make calls, no one is listening. So we gotta make our, find a way to make ourselves heard. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And we are here. We are poor. We are clergy. And we're here to say to our nation's capital and to the highest court in this land that everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to learn. Everybody has a right to love. Everybody has a right to live in wages. Everybody has a right to vote. Everybody has a right to thrive, to thrive in this society. Everybody say, ah! and the clergy, we read Article 6 of the Kentucky State Constitution that says we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. There will be a movement that will break through the calm and bring people together to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world.